From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Hackers find 122 vulnerabilities, 27 deemed critical during first round of DHS bug bounty program. Log4j, ransomware, and zero days still breaking records. And Zulor, pardon my French, internet in France gets cut. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines, and now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Hadas Kasorla, CISO of M1 Finance. Hadas, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And our sponsor for today is Farut. Know your client side attack surface. Join us on LinkedIn Live. Go to CISOseries.com, the Week in Review page, to find the link. We've got just 20 minutes, so let's dive right into it. Okay, our first story, hackers find 122 vulns, 27 deemed critical during the first round of DHS bug bounty program. 450 vetted security researchers were working through the Department of Homeland Security's Hack the DHS bug bounty program, which started in December 2021. They were eligible to receive between $500 and $5,000 per bug, depending on the severity. The DHS has not disclosed the vulns or shared any information about the fixes. So Hadas, how much should the DHS be held responsible for this high number of vulns, or is it even a high number, or should it actually be celebrated as a fairly low percentage given, you know, their, their infrastructure? So what's your take on this one? Depending on how much time they allowed people into the environment, I don't know if it's a low number or high number, or if this, it sounds like this is the first time they've ever done it. I just want to say it's about time. Um, Is it a high number? I don't know. I'm just really glad they're doing it. It seems like a brave move to to uh, put their, their themselves out there. So I agree. It seems like a step in the right direction. Uh, moving on to the next story, AWS's Log4j patches blew holes in its own security. So Amazon Web Services has updated its Log4j security patches after it was discovered that the original fixes made customer deployments vulnerable to container escape and privilege escalation. The vulns are high severity bugs, ranked 8.8 out of 10 on the CVSS scale. So question here, Hadas, seems to be another example of a vendor rushing to fix one hole and then in the process creating another hole, um, which you know has happened. But would you expect more from a, a large company such as, as Amazon? No, not really. This was a zero day. They had to move swiftly because a zero day means it's exploitable in the wild right now, just as everybody's finding out about it. So I think that they did what they had to do, which is come up with a patch. And sometimes patches don't work as you want them to. And so you build another one and do a hot patch. And I think that that's just par for the course. Um, And the fact that they came out with a hot patch as quickly as they did is great. Excellent. All right, we'll move along to our third story, which is Mandiant finds record zero days in 2021. Another zero day story for us. All right, according to the security firm's annual report, disclosed that zero day vulnerabilities exploded in 2021, more than doubling the previous 2019 record with 80. Most of the zero days tracked by Mandiant were exploited by APT groups, and Mandiant reports that China exploited more zero days than any other. So you know, the key question uh, had asked seems here um, that, you know, are, are the re- the numbers of zero days actually going up or is it, is it a case of more zero days being reported, better reporting? And also, what's your take on, on China, you know, exploiting the, the most zero days, at least according to this report? Yeah, I think um, the reason that the number is going up is because there's just more complexity in environments these days. And uh, there's also, you know, third party and fourth party uh, vulnerabilities now being found as zero days. And so more complexity means more bugs. Um, There's also more money in uh, finding the bugs. There's more researchers. There are some researchers and and bug bounty hunters that that's what they do for a living and they make a very fine living off of it. Um, And then also, you know, there's more international news just like China and and also the war between Russia and Ukraine. Hacktivism is what it is. And state sponsored actors is what it is. It's, it's, I don't know that it's surprising. Uh, I saw war games back in the 1980s, you know, like this was almost to be expected, right? Like this was, (laughs) we were, we were told this would be the future. We just maybe didn't believe it as much as we should have. Yeah, crazy that it seemed like science fiction back then, and it's definitely become a reality. And the and the the war in Ukraine has has really brought a a highlight. Maybe it hasn't 
uh, exposed new things, but brought a uh, put a spotlight on on some of the stuff that's going. It's been really interesting, and we've been tracking it. I'm sure as you as you have, but uh, yeah. fo- following along for sure. All right, let's move on to our next story. Uh, sorry, did you have something to add? No, there, Hadass? just taking a breath. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Stormus ransomware targets Coca-Cola. On Tuesday, Coca-Cola admitted that some of its systems were potentially hit by a ransomware variant, but says it is still investigating the incident. Meanwhile, Stormus ransomware group released a statement that it had indeed stolen 161 gigabytes of data from Coca-Cola and is intending to sell the data on the dark web if its ransom demands were ignored. Coke announced last month that it is withdrawing business from Russian Federation because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. On the other side, Stormus has been trying to make money supporting Russia's political agenda. So an interesting uh, story here. Do you think Stormus was trying to get at Coke's secret recipe, or is this a classic case of hacktivism, or maybe a little bit of both? I hope so. I mean, wouldn't it be exciting to finally get Coca-Cola secret recipe? I like to cook sometimes. And so I would love to just whip up a batch of Coca-Cola in my uh, kitchen. Although I don't think I have the necessary ingredients, certainly not the original. Um, having said that, you know, again, this is hacktivism and uh, and also cyber warfare. And this is the cyber war- warfare is just the state of the world anymore. Um, I think that making sure that your specific environments are doing the right security uh, vulnerability management and that you are conscious of these things and aware of them and keep your eye on the news will help. But I think that this is just where we're at now with cyber and with, with war. And honestly, these nation states were doing this already prior to the war breaking out. Um, we often were monitoring Russia and Ukraine and other countries for uh, for state actors. That I mean, that's great. And I guess I'd love your take on, OK, 161 gigabytes of data, um, you know, it, Usually it seems that when somebody claims that a hacking group, that it's it's legit. What's your take on that? Do you think there's ever the, hey, we've got your data and really don't, we just want the ransom? Or would you take take the uh, hacking group's claims, in this case, Stormus, uh, at face value if you were the, were, were Coca-Cola? Uh, I don't know. 161 gigabytes of data doesn't sound like a lot of data to me anymore. <laughs> um, and also it could be any, it could be any data, right? And it, if, if I were the one dealing with this, if I were Coca-Cola, I would want to um, find out what kind of data that they had before I determined what actions to take. Uh, I was recently at a conference where we did talk about how to negotiate with terrorists, and I, I mean the cyber criminals, um, and that it is a necessity. And part of the necessity of negotiating is to find out exactly what it is that they do have control of, because you don't want uh, if you do decide to not do anything and, and they do release that data, you do want to make sure that you're prepared for the fallout of it. But one 161 gigabytes of data is not a, a bunch. I mean, it's you don't want anybody stealing any of your data, but it's not a bunch. But also, I don't know. I just I would want to know what it is before I made any right? actions. <laughs> right. <laughs> if it isn't, right. it depends on what what's in there, too. There's My understanding of, is yeah. actually that Coca-Cola keeps their secret recipe and, only in writing and only in a vault. I mean, who knows if that's the truth, but that makes the most sense to me. If you really want to keep something secure, don't connect it to the internet. (laughs) That sounds a lot like the Krabby Patty secret formula, but excuse me, I'm a SpongeBob, uh, a SpongeBob (laughs) fan for sure. Do do you think, do you think that this would have any kind of adverse on on Coca-Cola's, um, you know, stock price, you know, even just, just even the story as it sits without knowing, you know, any more about, I'm sure it will unfold. What's, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I do know that there are companies that have experienced stock price hits from uh, ransomware or from uh, well-known attacks. Their stocks a year later were back at the same prices. So if it does have a stock price hit because of this specific act, action, I would guess that it would be very temporal. I would not, people are getting more inured to uh, these types of attacks and their data being out. And I just think that uh, it, you know, it's double-edged sword. Now we realize we actually do need to do something about cybersecurity, but also we're getting used to it and it's not as, 
as impactful to our psyche as it used to be. Excellent. All right. Now let's take a few moments and we'll spend with our our, uh, our sponsor for today, which is Farut. Uh, Farut secures client-side web applications so that businesses can deliver a flawless and safe digital user experience to their customers. Inspector and PageGuard, Farut's automated data protection solutions, increase code visibility, facilitate threat analysis, and detect and protect from dangerous client-side attacks such as MageCart, cross-site scripting, e-skimming, and other threats focused on front-end JavaScript and web applications. Learn more at www.farout.com. That's F-E-R-O-O-T.com. All right. Now on to a story we definitely couldn't leave out of this week's uh, program. Uh, Elon Musk's Twitter takeover could be bad for security and privacy. Who? Do you know? <laughs> oh, you haven't heard of Elon? Um, okay. So you don't have a Twitter <laughs> account. <laughs> um, uh, so, of course, we couldn't let the week go by without discussing it. Um, so he's making a lot of interesting and, frankly, weird uh, comments on Twitter right now, it seems, including buying McDonald's and fixing the ice cream machines. And in response to Coca-Cola's hack, he wants to buy that. Uh, he went on to, uh, quote, uh, he wants to put the cocaine back into the Coke formula. So that was a very interesting. So we're sure he was only joking, at least about the ice cream machines at McDonald's anyways. So I don't know. Elon <laughs> likes to 420. So maybe he's joking about Coca-Cola, maybe. He's not. I will say if he if he can actually fix the McDonald's ice cream machines, then Elon might be our next savior. Honestly, <laughs> like <laughs> that yeah, has I, been a real problem for a really long time. As I was reading it, I was trying to think, is this really weird or is this actually a good, a good thing that I'm kind of getting behind? But uh, but on the uh, I, I would totally be behind that. I, I would I would be willing to contemplate changing our constitution to allow him to run for presidential office if he could fix the McDonald's ice cream machines. And and maybe even bring back the McRib. Who knows? He may have a, 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 an impact uh, uh, far beyond what we know and, and what could be on Twitter. But um, there were some security concerns. Uh, and, and as much as that was f- uh, fun to discuss, there were some c- security and privacy concerns here that have been raised. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'd be interested in knowing if you think they're more speculative or, or actually there's some legitimacy to them. Um, Musk's open source vision for the platform uh, may make it more susceptible to malicious act- actors, um, gaming the algorithm, treating p- uh, people with, with more bias. Um, also, uh, concerns about implementing real name policies, so getting rid of anonymity and uh, which would kind of lift protections from those who may oppose uh, those in power. So I'd be in- really interested in your thoughts uh, thoughts here at us about, about those things. Yeah, I'll start with the open source. Um, I'm actually a proponent of it going open source for a couple of reasons. I think uh, open source is really helpful in security if you have a lot of eyeballs on the open source. If you have a very few eyeballs on the open source, it can actually be problematic because then you're telling all your secrets and nobody's fixing them. But if you have a lot of eyeballs on open source, then it can be helpful. In that vein, uh, I think... I read that it's something like 28% of adults have Twitter accounts. Um, So I think that he'd have enough eyes on that open source for people to uh, keep it secure, make it secure, uh, as opposed to security by obscurity, which can work, but only to a point. I also think that uh, some of the, some people I've heard talking about the open algorithms uh, were actually excited about it because it, uh, it, could potentially allow people to implement algorithms on their own accounts to prevent them from seeing specific content that they're not interested in seeing and to uh, be able to see the content that they actually want to see. So, um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of hmm, prognosticators out there want to tell you exactly what's in the cards and have no idea. I think I'm just excited to see what happens. I think that this change is probably good. As to the uh, de-anonymization, um, I don't know that that's what I've heard. I've heard that his uh, that what his plan is is to make sure that accounts are humans um, and to make sure that uh, they're authenticated properly. But I don't know if that means it's going to be de-anonymized. So we'll have to wait and see about that. I am kind of a little bit on the like, 
I, I don't know if it would be a bad idea to make things not anonymous anymore because anonymity has made people on Twitter and in the um, internet world kind of um, jerks. That's that's the four letter word I was looking for. Um, <laughs> they they you know, and so people people hide behind anonymity to be really mean to each other, and. It, Maybe, maybe there's a potential way to change some of that behavior by making people accountable for the words they use. Those are really great points. And I was wondering if I'm really glad you brought up that side of the coin. And, and some of this definitely, I mean, there's been a ton of speculation from the start, uh, obviously, uh, of this, um, this whole process of Elon buying the platform. Um, but, but it will be interesting. So you're of the, uh, let's get the popcorn and, and, and see how this unfolds, uh, mindset here. For sure. <laughs> also, I will tell you, it, it affects me zero personally. I, I used to have a Twitter account and it was such a time suck and also made me really, really sad all the time. And I stopped using it and I got, I, I started reading, um, books, you know, like, like books, like they more than 120 do characters. They still have or those? Whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> um, and it was just, it, I could, I could distinctly feel the difference between days when I was on Twitter, on on Facebook, and I just got rid of those accounts. It was too much. All right, thank you for those thoughts. We'll move on to the next story, which is two thirds of organizations hit with ransomware, according to Sophos State of the Ransomware twenty uh, twenty two. Re- uh, excuse me, 2022 report, 66% of organizations surveyed were hit with a ransomware attack last year, up from 37% in 2020. Yikes. This comes as ransom, uh, ransoms paid by organizations increased nearly fivefold to an average of $812,360. 11% of organizations said they paid ransoms over $1 million, up from 4% of orgs in 2020. So yikes. I mean, these are you know, you can put stock in numbers or not, but these are pretty compelling numbers. I mean, what are your thoughts? I mean, how do we better protect ourselves? It just seems like the attacks are getting more and more sophisticated and there are so many orgs still vulnerable to the to the ransomware attacks. Yeah, I you know, my first question in looking at this is I want to understand the makeup, the security makeup of those organizations. Did they have endpoint detection and response implemented? Did they have any kind of monitoring or any kind of uh, incident response plans? What what were they doing prior to getting hit with ransomware to protect themselves from ransomware? I see these numbers and I could totally use them in my board to create a lot of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But I, I just don't have enough context to have... I just have a lot of questions. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, do you think? I mean, is this something where tabletops could could help out with with um, preparedness or just a, a check on the key controls? I mean, what could an org be doing uh, to to better protect themselves? Yeah, I think ultimately what an org needs to do is the absolute basics of security of making sure they have some sort of detection and response in their environment and understand what their attack surface looks like. Uh, I think the biggest attack surface in a company is external emails coming in. I would love to see companies actually block external email unless it's absolutely necessary for the role. Uh, That's something I'm trying to implement at at my company as well. Uh, I also think that if you can if you have tooling in there that can help you detect, then you can prevent a lot of these things. That's not going to be a 100% silver bullet. Nothing is. But unless you're prepared to see and then prevent further uh, an attack from furthering itself, I, I, it's 2022. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you, blocking- if you can't do that, disconnect. <laughs> yes, blocking external email selfishly, I am in for that. And now, are you hiring? No, don't answer that. We will ask. <laughs> we'll ask you that in a minute. Um, okay, let, on, let's move on to the final story. I do want to get this one. It's very interesting. So the Fr- French fiber optic cable attacks uh, ex- accentuate uh, critical infrastructure vulnerabilities. A day after the French telecom companies are calling a large-scale coordinated attack, which destroyed a large number of fiber optic cables powering the French internet. 
Authorities are investigating the attacks as a criminal act. The Wednesday incident disrupted internet service throughout France, and those responsible seem to have known how to do as much damage as possible with the cables cut on both sides. Uh, so, I mean, this with all the tech and and we get drowned in encoding and, and and all these things, uh, we still forget that you know much of our network is still uh, pulled together by physical. Uh, cables. So, you know, what, what, what lessons can we take away from an attack like this? Uh, make sure you have a good disaster recovery plan and a good disaster recovery plan takes into account all the physical and uh, um, non-physical environment. So you need to know where your cables are. You need to make sure that you have fire suppression. You need to make sure that you have redundancy in your environment. I know it's probably really difficult to say, oh, well, they should have had redundant fiber optic cables. But when they put the fiber optic cables in, they probably were replacing copper and they could have potentially kept that in there as their backup in case something like this happened. So uh, good disaster recovery can help mitigate this attacks such as these. Well, thank you for that. And the 20 minutes has absolutely flown by. So uh, we are at the end of our show. And I, I want to thank you uh, for, for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and insights. It was um, my there, pleasure. Were there any stories here that stood out to you as, as your favorite for one, you know, an eye roller or something that you just resonated with you that we discussed today? I mean, it's kind of like you said, I've just, I'm going to go pop some popcorn and just watch the show with the Elon Musk Twitter thing. I think that's what everybody's talking about. I will also say that the DHS uh, bug bounty program is interesting to me as well. I think seeing the government finally come up to speed on cybersecurity is interesting. Awesome. And for our listeners, um, where can people find you and are you really hiring? I am on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Hadas Kasorla. That is my LinkedIn profile. Am I hiring? I am a cybersecurity professional. Of course I'm hiring. Mm -hmm. I am hiring for a security engineering manager and I am hiring for a cloud security engineer. And if you go to my LinkedIn profile, you can find it there. Or if you go to M1 Finance Jobs Board, you will find it there. All right. Thank you to our guest, Hadas Kasorla, CISO at M1 Finance. Also, thank you to Farood, our sponsor, Know Your Client Side Attack Surface. Next week, come on back for Super Cyber Friday, formerly known as the CISO Series Video Chat, where uh, we will be talking about hacking shadow data, an hour of critical thinking about discovering and managing sensitive data in unauthorized locations. And of course, we'll be back with another Week in Review show, starting, as always, at 3.30 3 p.m. Eastern and 12.30 Pacific. And you can still get your news fix on cybersecurity headlines every day, six minutes of the top cyber news stories. Until next week, I'm Sean Kelly, standing in for Rich Straffolino, who would want me to wish you all a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.